Hello and welcome to Court Games, a Legend of the Five Rings podcast funded by the Legend of the Five Rings Discord Patreon. This podcast will focus on the role-playing game stories and lore for Legend of the Five Rings. I'm Korva. I'm Kikita Kaori. This week we're going to continue our discussion from our last episode about the uh, tribal contracts, uh, the familial and tribal social contracts, and we are going to go on and talk about the governmental co- social contract, because this is the one that feels like it's the most powerful for L5R. It's not really. It's tribal and familial, I think, but it's also very important. It's the one you think you're working for. So let's go into that, and we'll talk about that this week. Sound good? Okay, let's go. All right. Quick reminder, a social contract is this unwritten, unspoken agreement that is formed between individual members of a group and the group itself to keep the group intact. Everybody puts something in, everybody supposedly gets something out, and that's a contract. A governmental social contract is generally united by geographic area. And that geographic area is claimed and controlled by a governmental organization of some sort. So it, it, it's very bounded in space. Base contract for a governmental social contract is that citizens, which are people as part of the contract, will sacrifice some of their freedoms and some of their resources, some of the financial support. And in exchange, the government will provide defense against their enemies from outside that region, that social group, security within that geographic region, social harmony, and some number of other benefits to the citizens of that group. The desired outcome that the citizens are looking for and the government is looking at, everybody who's in this governmental social contract is looking for, is social harmony and stability because people die without some organization to to structure it, okay? Tribes can fill that void to a degree, depending on the power of the tribe, but For citizen and government, there are these defined rules, and it can't be changed arbitrarily. Tribes, you can be kicked out for no reason. You don't know the rules. It's it's arbitrary what's in and out for a tribe. It, It doesn't have these clearly defined rules. In a governmental social contract, the definition of what a citizen is, what the government is, they're all clearly defined by rules, and they can't be changed just because something about you is different. There would have to be a some kind of process, with generally with, with known steps. An individual can be in more than one governmental system. Most of the time, it's a kind of a nested thing, like I'm in this province, which has this governor, which is part of this territory, which is run by this family, capital F, great clan family, which is run by this clan, which is all underneath the emperor. So that's the most kind of thing where, you know, that kind of nested within government, within government, within government. Also, you have a thing where if you are of the dragon clan, say, and you go into the phoenix clan, then the laws of where you are right now will generally take precedence over the laws of wherever you happen to have been. There are situations where there's, if there's an actual foreigner in court, somehow, they are going to still be bound by the rules of their government, but they're definitely also bound by the rules of where they're standing right this second. Now, a person is in a governmental social contract, whether they want to be or not. They just, they are. You're there, and therefore the rules of that contract apply. You don't get to walk away. Mm. Well, unless you literally, <laughs> you, have to, you sometimes have to walk quite far away, but yes. Right, you have to walk far away. But the rules of the contract are pretty much defined, but the interpretation of those rules will vary, and that's very important. Those rules can be interpreted by an individual leader, can be uh, interpreted by a group consensus, a judge and jury, it can be interpreted in a large number of ways. And by rules here, I want to be clear that I'm not talking laws. Laws are a subset of the rules, but not necessarily all of the rules. You can break the rules 
of the government social contract for the area you are in and not have broken any laws, especially if there aren't many written laws to begin with. <laughs> I mean, Rocky Ant particularly, you get the feeling that it's quite a legalistic society defending. Mm-hmm. In some things, pretty much everything is indeed spelled out. Some places it's not quite so spelled out. Rocky Ant, I think, is more, has more spelling out than, than a lot of places. Yes, and it's just important because in modern society, we've gotten laws pretty much for all of it and then some. But in a society where the governmental organization is the friendly dictatorship or not so friendly dictatorship of a dictator bill, then the rule is don't piss off dictator bill. And the interpretation of the rule is whatever dictator bill says. Or worse. And that's it. <laughs> whatever the, the, the person doing the interpretation thinks might annoy Dictator Bill. Exactly. Yeah. So it might not be very complex rules, but they're, they're rules, all right? They just aren't written down, and you might not agree with them, but they're, they're the rules that apply in the place you are in, and you have to conform to them whether you like it or not, and you can't leave, well, unless you actually leave the whole area under the control of Dictator Bill. Because of these limits, they can be very, very arbitrary. And arbitrary can mean harmful for the citizens. So that is why these rules get turned into laws. It's for the protection of the people within it, within the region generally. And also it's because part of the point of a government, as opposed to a tribe, as opposed to a family, is that stability, not just social stability, but Knowing that if I do this, this is going to be the outcome. I know what works and what doesn't. I am assured what's going to happen tomorrow. I can make plans for the future. I can make investments, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Because when things become very arbitrary and no one has any faith that they know what's going to happen tomorrow or how that law is going to be interpreted or how people, whether, whether what I do, what my job is, is that going to be illegal tomorrow? I don't know. People start acting in ways that really aren't good for society as a whole. They become very conservative, small c conservative, very risk averse. They don't try stuff. They hoard because they're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow. And one of the things a good government can do, or a, a functioning government, because functioning is not quite the same as good, let us be clear on that, right. is being certain, that certainty, that confidence of what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's super important. And that's one of the parts of the contract that's really not written down a lot. That's, that's one of my arbitrary stuff can be bad, not just for the individual citizen who's suddenly discovering that what they've been doing for the past seven years is now suddenly illegal. And that's bad for them, obviously. Or, or, the, or it's arbitrary because that particular judge is picking on you. That's bad for you as an individual. But for the society as a whole, it's really bad because now you don't know what's good and what's bad. And so now you stop trying. Right. You can't plan for the future and you can't live out your other contracts well. You can't, you can't do a lot of things. And the whole point of having a government is, is to give you that security that you can you can go ahead and do that. That's that's the point of the governmental contract is is security and social harmony within an area. Yep. Okay. So who enforces the governmental contract? Well, usually there are selected air agents that go and make sure that the governmental social contract is obeyed. That might be police. In general, a government, because it is providing defense has a military unit to do the defending, but they'll apply it internally as well as externally. But also tax inspectors, bureaucrats who, you know, the, the people who inspect weights and measures, uh, you know, the, the people who, who check for hygiene standards and, and things like that, that is also a means by which these rules are enforced. And you are a samurai. And so that means generally that's your job. That's what you get to do. Part of it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, in, within the governmental organization overall, because you are on this upper part of it, when you're playing a samurai in L5R, you're going to be doing the enforcement. So 
You know, if you want to do it well, you can't do it arbitrarily because we just talked about why arbitrary is bad. This is certainly true of the very common Emerald Magistrate campaign. You know, it, it is absolutely, it is straight up written into it where you are enforcing the law. And, and this is why, not necessarily, is, you know, we, we, people have argued whether or not the society is worth defending in Legend of the Five Rings. Mm-hmm. Is Rock and society worth defending? This is how and, and why a particular character will probably think it is. Mm-hmm, because otherwise it'll be arbitrary. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what the, how the government enforces citizens to fulfill their part of the social contract. On the citizen part of the social contract, if the government is not fulfilling their part of the social contract, their first defense is usually redress from a higher authority in the government. So the government is usually made up of different tiers. Each tier of government oversees the tier below it. So if you are below and you are being oppressed by a government functionary, agent of the government, as it were, the first thing you could do is go to that agent's superior and say, this person is not fulfilling his part of the social contract. He is being oppressive and that is not in our social contract. We then have the right, and yes, rights come into it there, to not be beaten up by you know, the, the people picking on my village. And that's very legitimate. The government is structured to do that. That's, that's part of the point. Bring it back to the, the Emerald Magistrate campaign. That is also, you're not just enforcing rules top down. It's entirely reasonable. If someone comes to you and says, this bad thing is happening. This person is doing these wrong things. You have the authority to look into it. Please do. You know, so Mm -hmm. That is also an aspect of what you're doing. Not just the top-down stuff, but the bottom-up stuff. The most information we have about the commoner's lifestyle throughout historical Japan is reams and reams and reams of complaints from villagers complaining about their lords or, you know, complaining about people to higher authorities. Yeah. (laughs) Because that, I mean... Because it's an important paperwork and it ends up being kept. Yeah. Or, you know, it was considered important at the time and therefore it was kept. And that's where we have a huge amount of our understanding of commoners' lifestyles is just how these complaints. But about the only time, unfortunately, about the only time that the people in charge felt the need to write this stuff down about the commoners. Exactly. Because um, otherwise, obviously, everybody knows. Well, it's not even that. So why, why would we write that down? Oh, my God, they're farmers, which is a terrible attitude. And how dare they? Because they didn't write stuff down for us to look at afterwards. <laughs> yes. Anyway, if the government is not fulfilling any of its functions properly and redress isn't working, that is when you get rebellion. And that is when the bulk of the citizens declare the current governmental structure is no good and replace it with a different governmental structure. It must be said, just as there's different levels of government, there's different levels of rebellion. Because you can have things like a group of villagers saying, we are not going to pay our tax and we are not going to work in the fields until this issue is redressed. Right. So they're not actually like trying to overthrow the entire government of the country or even their region. They're just saying, We're not getting what we should get out of the social contract. So we're withholding what we should give under the social contract until that changes. So you can actually have things that, oh, it's a peasant rebellion, but they're not attacking the the castle town and they're not trying to murder the daimyo. They're just having a sit-in protest or they're refusing to work. That happened a lot. That happened a lot in Japan. But obviously, again, there's also... Attempts to overthrow absolutely everything. That, that, that is also sometimes a thing that can happen. Right. So basically, when there is a rebellion, ideally, the end goal of a rebellion is to change the system of government one way or another, if it, especially if it gets violent. Now, note, that could be for the worse. That could be significantly for the worse. If you are an individual citizen and you are not getting what you want out of the government, for you personally, you can choose to do the rebellion to overthrow the government to benefit you in a way that is worse for the people. Absolutely. Who would be under you. 
and and now you're warlords. <laughs> and, and you can look at a lot of rebellions over, like the French Revolution is a classic example. Because first off, you get the terror, and to start off with, yeah, they were going after the aristocrats who uh, they considered to be the cause of all their problems. But then they just started guillotining lots of people who weren't part of the aristocracy. And it also must be said that within a generation, they had an emperor, right? Less, and so, so they go from, we don't want aristocrats anymore, to vive l'empereur within less than a generation. And this is the Sengoku, basically. Everybody's, everybody's going to be overthrowing their, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, and everyone's fighting everybody, and there's no central government at all. And so everything goes a bit mad. Um, so that's an, the, yeah, that, that is another uh, possible outcome from rebellion. And another reason why someone might say, we must stop this rebellion, even if we think, yeah, actually these people are having a bit of a bad deal and maybe their, their wants and needs should be looked after. But we cannot allow this to continue because then there'll be anarchy and everyone is going to be in trouble then. You know, that, that can be a valid point of view that you must stop this now or everything will burn. And that's not particularly good. Right. So we're talking about enforcement from, you know, the top down, bottom up and rebellion. What happens when this social contract, this governmental social contract is broken? Now, the obvious one is the one we're all familiar with is if a citizen breaks their half of the contract, they will receive punishment up to and including no longer being a citizen. And sometimes that's because they're no longer alive. Right. It tends to be no longer alive. Exile from the region is actually rarer. Well, sometimes historically there's this concept of being an outlaw where... That's yeah, true. That's generally where they don't have you to hand. You know, we, we don't have you to hand right now but we're going to declare that you are no longer a citizen, you are no longer protected by the law, which means anybody can do anything to you and it does not matter, and there will be no legal punishment. Bearing in mind that when you're talking about great clans or the great clan families or even a daimyo and their retainers, they are a government. Yeah, there's kind of a tribe sort of government, but they also have government aspects. And becoming a ronin is essentially being told you are no longer a citizen of this province or this daimyo, and now you're a Ronin. So that, there, is a, there is sometimes a bit of that. Also, when you are imprisoned or you become a slave laborer in the mines, you are effectively not a citizen. That's another kind of absolute ultimate is you're not a citizen because you're dead. Sometimes you're not a citizen because you're in exile. That doesn't happen too much in Rock Again, although historically there were cases of exile, but that was mostly noble who tried to overthrow somebody. So you get to live on this tiny, tiny island for the rest of your life, and just so you can't bother anybody. Doesn't tend to happen if you're a commoner. They tend to go for the, um, you're a bit too tall, take the head off. There you go, better. <laughs> but you can also receive other sorts of punishment as well, ranging from fines to corporal punishment to all sorts. Now, in Rokugan, there is a case system. And you can think of case systems as being degrees of citizenship. So you can be a full citizen, you're a half citizen, and it's still part of a government structure. But the government acknowledges if you are this class of citizen, you get these rights and privileges. If you're this class of citizens, you get these rights and privileges and, you know, things you have to deal with. So you could have social moving down or moving up within the structure as another enforcement mechanism of the government. Historically, as we know, the very lower class, the, the grave diggers and the leather workers and the butchers, um, mm -hmm. Barakumin, you could be sentenced to effectively that social class. You could earn your way back out. So you weren't born into it because there were the people who were born into it and they're stuck there. It is theoretically possible to be sentenced as a criminal matter into that class which came with the possibility of getting out of it again, but uh, I don't think it was very easy. It wasn't easy, but you could technically work your way out of it, even if you were born into it too. But that, that's just like you could, uh, a ronin could become a samurai. Ronin is a whole separate thing. You could even, as an Ashigaru, you know, you could become a, a Jish samurai as a, you know, it's not easy, but it happened. 
you know, Hideyoshi is like always the example people use. He, he was from a, you know, he's a commoner coming a, a samurai because of how he was able to work within the government structure, albeit the military side, but you know, of the Japan that was. Yeah. So anyway, you, changing social class is, a, is another way to enforce the citizen side of the contract, I guess. So that's if the citizen breaks their half of the contract. What if the government breaks their half of the contract? Well, obviously, just to re- reiterate, you can appeal to a higher level, which sometimes could be, there could be judicial review, which is effectively if the law is considered to be above that level of government. Like, the law is not above, in Rokugan anyway, the law is not above the emperor. We know that much. Although the emperor is bound by traditions and such. But there isn't anybody who can say, the judge has ruled you cannot do this. Pretty much everyone underneath the emperor, there is someone who can say, the law says you must do this, or the law says you must not do that. So if you can appeal to someone who is that authority, that is the thing you can do. It is possible if you feel the government has completely uh, rejected its half the contract, you can leave. But that can involve walking a very long way. (laughs) <laughs> and the final thing can be rebellion, which can be torches and pitchforks, but it can also be secret meetings in basements. Or it could be, we're going to set up our own warlord and army and we're going to conquer another region. It could also mean trying to infiltrate the government and sneakily replace people with people who think as you do. There's a bunch of different ways. <laughs> But basically, you're changing the government structure itself. Working towards it anyway, whether you, you may not succeed. Right, to, in a way that, to one that favors you. Yeah. Now, interestingly, I think this is very interesting in relationship to Alpha 4, organized crime is a social structure just like the other ones, and it has a social contract. And it is a governmental-style social contract. It has a tribally aspect to it, but yeah, once they get beyond a certain size, yeah, it starts becoming government-y. It's bounded in geographic space, almost always, right? So it might be running the city or something. There are rules that you know, and if you follow the rules, then you get protection. And if you don't follow the rules, then enforcers will come and break your kneecaps. The exact mathematical opposite, opposite of protection. Right. You don't get a choice on whether or not you're part of the organized crime tribe? Well, there's often an initiation. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll back it up. The organized crime gang itself is somewhat tribal. The people who live under the organized crime regime are not part of the tribe. They are living under a government run by the criminal tribe. This is like the shopkeepers who have to pay protection money. Exactly. Things like that. They don't get an option of to whether or not to pay protection money unless they want their shop burned down. Right. Or the firefighter gangs or the Yakuza who have taken over the drug dealing in the city or, yeah, things like you You don't get a choice when you are a person living in that area. Yeah. About the criminal element that's over you. You just get to be told what the rules are. And if you don't follow them, you are hurt. You are in trouble. Now, how do you advance in such an organization? Well, first you have to be initiated into the criminal organization itself, usually by doing crime. And then how you advance in that depends on how well you follow the rules of the organization and your enthusiasm for the organization's goals. So the rulership of the criminal gang, that all is tribal. How are you at focusing on its goals? But for Everybody else, you know, it's under a government that's run by a tribe, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just add on an extra tribally kind of layer on top. It's a very common trope in, I wouldn't say samurai fiction, because we're not, generally we're not talking about samurai at this point. But if you look at things like Zatoichi, um, Lone Wolf and Cub also deals with the criminal organizations and the games and stuff. There is an aspect where if you are one of the gambling types or one of the criminal types, that 
you should be able to go into the territory of another gang, like you go to a different city. If you behave yourself and you announce yourself to the local Oyabun and you follow all the rituals, there is a kind of fellowship there. So there is a sort of tribal, if you belong to us, you belong to all of us. But like you say, if you're just one of the shopkeepers in that area, yeah, it's, it's effectively a form of government for whom there really isn't much recourse. There isn't anybody, I mean, technically the police, but that can be very dangerous, or the, the magistrates, but that can be quite dangerous. Uh, but there isn't anyone within the criminal organisation generally that you can say, could you please stop these people from doing what they're doing? Uh, although, again, you look at the Yakuza, the actual real-life Yakuza, they kind of are like that. They enforce rules and mm-hmm. they will apologise for noise, <laughs> noise disturbance, the noisy disturbances, being noisy neighbours and things like that. Exactly. It can, it can be a little bit like that. So, yeah. Right. So that criminal government structure, it can have those appeals because the alternative, if you are a shopkeeper living under a criminal regime, and especially if you can't call on another government structure like the magistrates to do it, is to rebel. And that happens. So then the shopkeepers band together and they (laughs) say, okay, we're going to rebel against this structure that has been controlling us. Or they hire this blind masseuse guy who is surprisingly good with the sword that he keeps in his cane. Or seven convenient Ronin. Yes, yes, seven convenient Ronin who just happened to be who happened to have shown up. Yeah, exactly. That I mean, that's that's that is that story is the the tribal you know. So the 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 villagers in the seven Ronin are not part of the government that's ruling over them. I'm, I'm sure there are structures inside that government for how you advance and stuff that's more tribal, but they are rebelling against the governmental structure that's that's forcing them to give up all their food and, and beating them up and stuff because they don't want it anymore. That's the seventh samurai. So anyway, yeah. so you might end up playing with that structure. So I thought I'd mention it. Hmm. All right. Final section I wanted to talk about with all of this today is we have Rokugan. So what it, yeah. there is government type social contract in Rokugan. Okay. Uh, government social contract. But we have to each each one is different. So in the United States, we have a social contract involved, you know, that's kind of stated in our constitution and all the rules that apply, but it yeah. involves voting from all the citizens to put a government structure in, above us that then creates the laws by which we follow and we agree to follow them. And then those cases are judged. And, and there is an assumption that the law trumps everybody. Every, right. No, There is a rule of law that applies to absolutely everybody. And even the tippy top person of mm-hmm. the structure is subject to the law. Right. So that's At least in theory. our governmental social contract. And every, every country has a little bit different of them. And we're not, yeah. I've had enough politics talking <laughs> this stuff yeah. already. But in simplifying all of this down into trying to codify it for the game, I find it as useful to have a written, stated, clear social contract that describes the government side, at least, of this whole thing, right? Especially if mm. I've got my players trying to be samurai because they're on the government side. <laughs> They're on the upper end of the the social contract here. This is not stated anywhere in the materials. That's not a common thing role-playing games have, but it helps. So this is the one I use. In return for the obedience, you know, the portion of freedom and taxes that the government of Rokugan takes, okay? The government offers Protection from your enemies, defense against spirits of other realms, and prosperity for lands. Okay? And in my storytelling, I use this as, I, I, I say this is the, the code by which the samurai was set up at the dawn of the empire. So when the kami came to earth, right, and Hante met Sapoon on Sapoon Hill, 
he came into an agreement with her, saying, me and my brothers and sisters will offer protection from your enemies, defense against the spirits of other realms, and prosperity in your lands in exchange for you serving us and supporting us. Okay? Mm. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the core social contract. All right? If you take those three clauses, it breaks out into the three kinds of samurai in L5R. So protection mm-hmm. from your enemies. That is the bushi. If you are a bushi right. in L5R, your job by the social contract for the whole world is to protect the people of Rokugan, protect the citizens under this contract from the enemy, their enemies. Okay? In, the, in your government mm-hmm. structure. That's, you're, you're a fighter. Yeah. That's, that's your, you protect them from the enemies. That could be with your sword. It could be with other means. But that's, that's your job as a bushi. If you are Shiginja, your job is to defend the people from spirits of other realms. This could be by appeasing the kami. This could be, uh, you know, offering things to the fortunes to make them happier. This could be, mm. you know, fighting off Oni from Jikoku who crawled through. It could, yeah. be, it could be anything. Uh, in a world where, you know, mental illness is actually fox spirits playing tricks on you. Mm. That's a Shiginja job to do. You, you, you're supposed yeah. to defend against that. That's, that's your job um, in the contract. And the third part of it, and this is where it gets, people have a hard time with it, is the prosperity of your lands. And in L5R, this is what courtiers do. This is the job of courtiers, is to make the land prosperous. Okay? Now, prosperity, in, in some kinds of versions of the mandate of heaven, we see this often with, with Chinese philosophy, right? It's a, the emperor is doing a good job because the land will magically be prosperous. Okay? Mm. That's not what I'm talking about here. Prosperity is, is built. And, it, and the courtiers are in charge of making sure that prosperity is built. That could be through trade. It could be done through um, negotiations and keeping the peace as opposed to protecting from enemies. It could be done through building public works. It could be done through roads. It could be done through keeping track of everything and making sure the right people get the right resources to build that. It could be from proper planning for the future. You know, planting trees for your grandchildren. In the end, yeah. job of courtiers is to build the prosperity of the land. So Bushi Shikinja Courtier, which are the three fundamental ways that L5R breaks down its, its classes. And you, as a samurai, inherit from the kami, from the founding of the empire, the contract to provide these things to the common people, to the rest of the world, in exchange for the support and obedience that you get from them. So that's your job. So when I say mandate of heaven, that's what I mean by mandate of heaven. It's like, it's the social contract that founds the samurai class. Yeah. And this can also lead in the kind of Confucian ideals of Japanese society, certainly, especially the Edo period, which a lot of the society of Rokugan is based off, where the idea is if everyone plays their part and, and listens to the, the people who are in charge, and the, so the people on, on top are looking out for the people below them, and the people below are doing the right thing, playing their part, playing their role, everything will be harmonious and everything will work fine. Like there's a, the, the, an, there's an analogy of like an orchestra where there is a conductor and there are, you know, first violin and second violin. There are, there are higher, there's a hierarchy and, and you have to follow. You have to follow the leader. Otherwise, it's all anarchy and nothing gets done. Whereas if everyone plays their part, plays their role, no matter how glorious it is or inglorious it is or menial it is, then you get harmony and everything works lovely. Now, whether right. this is true in practice is, all, is, a, is a whole other question. But that's the philosophy. That's the belief. Right. And that is part of this idea that the samurai, who have a lot of power over a lot of people, they are supposed to be using that power for the benefit of the people as a whole. And these rules, they're not the same as laws. We've talked about the little difference between them. Bushido, then, is 
the rules for samurai. That's the, the things that they're, if the samurai is doing all of their things the way they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Those are, they are following the rules of being a samurai, as in the rules of being a bushi for, you know, what I talked about, bushi shigenja courtier, then they're doing their part and the land and everyone will be stable and peaceful and prosperous. But people don't follow the rules and therefore it never actually really is that way. So take that to it. You are a samurai in L5R. Okay. Yeah. And there's a peasant rebellion going on. Why should you put down the present rebellion? This is an oppressive regime overall, or at least there's not a lot of freedom. Well, are the peasants rebelling against a lord who has broken their parts of the social contract? If the lord has not broken their social contract, then the peasants are breaking their part of the social contract. Just as if you go into a city and there's rioting going on, but there's nothing that has triggered that riot on the part of governmental authorities. It's just people rioting for, like, let's just say a, a neo-Nazi riot, a, a neo-Nazi mm. thing. Mm. Or when the, when the football teams... Or when the football teams... They, they, that happened recently, didn't that, in England? I, I, I don't... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. we've, had, we've, had, we've had football teams, and they've just kind of gone crazy, depending on whether or not they win or lose, they just go mad. Right. Yeah. So the society hasn't broken down because the football game was lost, but there was a riot. All right. If it's, if the society, if the, the Lord is filling their part of the social contract, but the peasants are rioting or are rebelling, then you as the samurai, you know, are, are coming in to stop that and put the social contract back together. If the Lord is oppressing the peasants, though, they are breaking the social contract, and your job is to get things back to base and maintain the contract fairly for both sides, if you are a good samurai and, and trying to do the best thing. Yeah. There. So hopefully that's an answer you can take back to your players. Hopefully we gave you some language, some things to talk about, and um, I hope that this was some benefit for you, because we just talked a yeah. long time about it. <laughs> So that, that's, that's been our topic for now. This has been talking about the social contract theory and how that will apply to Rock End. And like has been said, we hope you find this useful. We'd like to call out our sister podcast and our patrons. We'll call out to Fortune and Strife, our affiliated actual play podcast, currently on medical hiatus. And we must also shout out our friends at D20 Radio, who have a huge amount of role-playing game-related podcasts. So there's something in there for anyone at D20 Radio. Our content is funded by the Community Discord Patreon, which supports our editing costs, as well as our website, where you can see and store some longer-term information, summary of our podcasts, uh, the results of our competitions that we've had, one-page adventures, all kinds of other RPG tools, and more. For our patrons, we will have special bonus content like adventure seeds, early access, and other things as we think of them. Online, you can find us at courtgamespod.com, at twitter.com slash courtgamespod, and on Patreon at patreon.com slash court games. But that is it for us this week. This is Kakita Kaori. May the fortunes favor you. And I have been Korva. And until we meet again, keep your jade handy.